Hello friends, this is Shobha from CNS and today we are in conversation with Michelle Warren, Executive Director of AVAC since 2004 and co-chair of the ongoing virtual fourth HIV Research for Prevention Conference. Michelle is also the president of TV Alliance Stakeholders Association. Welcome Michelle and my sincere thanks to you for finding time to speak with us despite your busy as a bee schedule. We know uh, how busy you are. It's, Shabba, it's great to see you and, and so glad that you are a part of this year's HIV Research for Prevention Conference. You and CNS have been such a great partner in getting good, accurate information out. No, no, that the, the pleasure is totally ours and the, the privilege is also ours, Michelle. Uh, so, Michelle, we have known you as a strong voice on ethics and human rights for HIV prevention and research for over two decades now. And you have been such an inspiration for so many of us. What has changed over the years when you look back to your journey since then? And uh, I want to do in so many terms, like what has changed in terms of science and ethics and human rights, uh, translating clinical efficiency into public health effectiveness, uh, reducing delay between product development and product delivery. I think too many questions, but to, we would uh, love to hear from you. But those are great questions, Shoba. And, and I, I, so many things have changed over the decades, in, in, yes. and some of it actually positively. And I think the scientific advances in HIV, even in the last year, we've seen huge new insights gained on a range of, of HIV prevention fronts and HIV treatment fronts. Sadly, what hasn't changed is the, the lack of equity in the response. We still see whether we're in 2021 or 2001 or 1991, that those who are most marginalized, most stigmatized, most criminalized remain so. And, and our science has advanced, but our, our human rights, our politics, our policies have been far too slow to adapt. And we know in HIV, uh, the virus itself is so quickly changing and mutating and science has a hard time keeping up. But sadly, I think sometimes our response has, has not kept up. But I, I will say that I think we're seeing even in the midst of, of, of COVID, we are seeing some progress, but I think the last year has really shown a light on both inequity and also that how fragile our gains have been in HIV, that um, we did make progress, but they, it wasn't just that they were, they were chipped away because of COVID, but they have been set back in the last year. So we not only have to deal with COVID, but we have to, to really work uh, extra hard um, to, to protect the gains that had been made because they disappear all too quickly. Right, right. In fact, uh, at the first HIV R4P conference in 2014, you had spoken about the challenge of what you called embarrassment of riches in HIV prevention response. And uh, yes, prevention means little if people cannot access it. And mm. it does not translate into controlling transmission and reducing the number of new infections. And uh, as you said, much has been achieved in the field of HIV prevention research. Mm. But still we have 1.7 million new infections in 2019, which was not different from what was there in 2018. Uh, yeah. And that was even before COVID. So where are we actually lacking? You had mentioned some points there. Where are we lacking in fully utilizing all combination prevention approaches, which we have in our hands today to end yeah, it by 20? Yes. Yeah, Shobi, you have an amazing memory um, that six years ago at that first R4P yes. Um, yes. that I might've said that. And in fact, scientifically, we have even more riches than we did in 2014. Back in 2014, I was probably talking about oral prep, which was brand new. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea that we had so many additional options in research, vaccines and the vaginal ring and the antibody trials were just beginning back in 2014. Mm -hmm. And so in some respects, uh, again, it's back to this issue that science has actually moved very quickly, not quickly enough, but uh, compared to COVID, but quickly. But our programs and policies have been sluggish at best because the sad truth is that in 2014, we had about 1.7 or 1.8 million new infections. And as you point out in 2019, that number stayed pretty much the same. Um, we are failing in primary prevention. 
We are certainly seeing huge progress in treatment programs that are now being set back because of COVID, but there had been great advances of, um, of, of helping many more people access treatment and get to virologic suppression, which is critical. The idea that you know, undetectable is untransmittable. But yet this translation of what happens in clinical trials into programs, and most importantly, into public health impact has been our Achilles heel. We have now this week heard um, not only about the WHO recommending the vaginal ring as an additional option for women, which is a huge milestone. We saw more data about the injectable cavitegravir um, in clinical trials. Um, that's still going to be at least a year or so before we can see regulatory approvals. But um, our biggest challenge is how do we take those ideas, those concepts in clinical trials and make them real. And one of the things I think, Shoba, that I, I, I have been thinking a lot about is that the research and development uh, uh, in HIV has developed many new options mm -hmm. for us, rings, pills, yes. injections, mm -hmm. um, antibody research this week giving us some interesting yes. insights. Those are all options, mm -hmm. but people need choices. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to move from the research and development phase that develops options to delivering real choice for people. And that's where we get into the policies and the programs and, 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 and the need to get health providers to provide these options as viable choices without, um, without um, a stigma, without um, predetermining who they think as a provider should get which product. Um, we need all of that to help people have this array of options at their disposal to say, that one fits for my life right now and I can prevent an infection. Until we move from options to choices, we're gonna continue with 1.7 million new infections, I fear. So the, the challenge is, is incredibly high right now. So do you think that uh, particularly in the present times and what I'll come to this, what we have seen with COVID-19, is politics overriding science uh, in, uh, in some places? And I would just take the example that the way COVID-19 vaccine R&D has gone, uh, that was tremendous at the pace at which all the stakeholders got together and we have got some vaccines within one year. Means I think that is, that is unprecedented in the Absolutely. field of vaccine. So uh, I would like you, uh, your uh, insights on two points. The pace has been tremendous and uh, you, were among those who had called for no avoidable delay in research and rollout in mm -hmm. HIV prevention. You have been doing that since years. But were ethics and human rights protected with utmost integrity as science galloped ahead? Also in the case of COVID-19 vaccine. And has the science of COVID-19 vaccine research been explained to those who will get it? Or have we forgotten that altogether in our quest to get the vaccine? Well, you know, very often, Shoba, sadly, in, in research and development, the focus is always on the product. Mm -hmm. and, and we need that to some degree. Yes. Without that focus, without investments from governments, from philanthropists, from companies to develop products, we really can't end epidemics. But so often, we have this disproportionate focus on the product, and we forget about the programs and the people. And you know, it was said many years ago in polio vaccines that a safe and efficacious vaccine that sits on the shelf is neither safe nor efficacious. Mm -hmm. And I would say the same thing, whether it's a COVID vaccine or a vaginal ring or a new uh, HIV prep product, that safe and efficacious products um, in clinical trials are not safe and efficacious until people can use them. And we have to understand, and, and we're still seeing now with this, and, and you're right, the, the pace of COVID vaccine development is breathtaking. And it happened because of a huge global commitment. It happened because of huge financial resources. It also happened because frankly, SARS-CoV-2 is an easy pathogen to develop a vaccine around compared to HIV. Um, that's very clear. So no matter how much money we have in HIV vaccines, the, the virus itself is still our greatest challenge. But to your point about um, how we deliver them, um, we can go fast and we can sit here and say how breathtaking it is, but to some people that breathtaking speed is horrifying. 
the, the assumption that maybe people cut corners, that we didn't do research in the proper way, you know, and follow all the right safety and, and engagement guidelines. Um, and in fact, one of the things we have to do is not be dismissive. When people say, I don't trust your vaccine because you went so fast, the knee-jerk reaction from some is to say, oh, you're wrong. Everything's fine. Just trust us. Well, there's a lot of reason all over the world to be mistrustful of politics, of research. We have a whole history of this. So we have to take people where they are, meet them where they are, hear what their concerns are, explain to them. We talk a lot in, in you know, the work that we've done at AVAC and with many partners about the good participatory practice guidelines and research. Yeah. The core tenet of that is research literacy, is helping all of us, scientist, product developer, advocate, you know, trial participant, to, to, to understand research process, to know that there are safeguards. And, and I feel very confident that the majority of these vaccines have been tested in, in elegant, um, well-designed, safe and, 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 and well-designed um, well trials. But we have to make sure that other people don't believe that because the researcher told them, but that they understand that process. And, and we need to, to recognize there's going to be some of that mistrust. Um, and we need to, to work with communities, not because we have a vaccine. We should have been doing this months ago when the research was happening. And some of the trials did a beautiful job of this um, uh, in, in helping people understand that. We need to recognize all of this is a journey. Product development, and product delivery. And we need to know that the person you know, who's gonna get that vaccine or use that HIV prevention product is part of that journey from the beginning, not the recipient of someone else's journey. And, and that sounds easy um, and it's actually not rocket science. Um, we have good examples of how to do this. And that really, for me, is the message of, of how you roll out a product um, for any um, infectious disease. Yeah, rightly so. Uh, but in the case of COVID-19 vaccine, I'm coming back to that. Yeah. It's not about, as you said, a lot of research has gone, but still there are some vaccines which are being rolled out on the basis of the phase one and phase two trial results. And that is yeah. creating more of a mistrust and vaccine hesitancy. Absolutely. I think because they, it is being said that, uh, like the messaging from, uh, from the governments is that the vaccine has found to be, is found to be safe. So just safety of the vaccine, and this is the sort of uh, information and messages which is going, going to the population, which I think is creating more mistrust because at least that needs to be ensured unless there is some phase three data. Uh, Absolutely. It's, so, it's a real concern, Shoba, that we, um, obviously a, a global pandemic like, like SARS-CoV-2, um, is horrifying and it's changed our world in, in, in every imaginable way. And there's a real desperation for vaccines and to get our life back to normal, whatever that normal might be in the future. Um, but again, we must never cut corners and you're right. Um, you know, there are examples where, where countries and national regulatory agencies have made decisions um, far earlier. Um, we've seen it in a number of countries where people said, oh, well, it was safe in a phase one trial. Let's give it to tens of millions of people. That is, that is not the scientific process. The scientific process is we see safety in phase one. We move to phase two um, to get better ideas of safety in larger numbers of people. And we begin to see the um, potential dose responses. And then we go into the larger phase three trials. It's only then. So I think it's really important globally um, to recognize that only a few vaccines have been shown to be safe and effective in phase three trials and have been approved by what we call stringent regulatory authorities. And we need to be sure, and I think it's one of the reasons why we need a strong World Health Organization. Um, we've never needed global engagement um, in the way we need today because vaccine nationalism that either hoards a safe and effective vaccine in their country or approves a product before we actually have appropriate data. Both of those are examples of uh, uh, an inability to respond to this epidemic properly, I think. We need, we need global solidarity to recognize there are standards that need to be upheld so that we can say with confidence that this set of vaccines is shown to be safe and effective. Obviously, national regulators need to do that, but having a robust World Health Organization that can help provide that global assurance um, that can begin to then 
um, support national governments and national regulatory agencies with safe and effective products. Every trial should study, does study safety, but only certain trials study the efficacy, the, the large phase threes. And until we have that data, I think it's irresponsible um, to begin max vas mass vaccinations. Um, and that's the kind of information, Shoba, that we really need to help people understand um, of, again, that research literacy of what we know, what we don't know, and be honest about that. Rightly, you're very right. And I'm grateful that in one of our meets uh, of the media fellows, uh, there was uh, Sarah and others, the researchers, they emphasized that even with the vaccine, you cannot do away with the other prevention methods. They have to continue. And I think that message should go out strongly. And Absolutely. You know, Shoba, there's so many things in the last year where I, I've, I've said, uh, uh, Mark Twain famously said, history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes a lot. And I am struck in the last year of the rhyming between HIV and COVID. And what you just okay. described, um, you know, even after a vaccination with, for, yeah. for SARS-CoV-2, yeah. one should still wear a mask because we don't yet know if these vaccines prevent transmission. We know they're the ones that have been, been approved, we know um, prevent severe disease. Um, so we still need mask wearing, we still need physical distancing. And the reason I say it rhymes with HIV is, it, it, and you said it earlier, combination prevention. And actually, I would say combination treatment and prevention. Um, HIV requires an integrated and comprehensive response. Treatment for those who are infected, um, prevention options made real choices for people who are uninfected, all done comprehensively. The same is true as COVID. We obviously need the, the few treatments we have and we need more treatments um, for, for, for SARS-CoV-2 um, and vaccines and mask wearing. These global pandemics teach us that it is not a singular response. No one intervention um, ends these pandemics. It's when we do these comprehensively, not just the biomedical work, but all of the rights-based policies that we talked about. It's when we are comprehensive and integrated in our responses to these epidemics, that's when we can get to disease control, not before. Right. And you have been such a strong voice for engaging all stakeholders that can ensure translating science into public health outcomes without delay or as soon as possible. So uh, what uh, challenges do you foresee in the rollout of say, uh, you had mentioned that the Depivirine ring, the long acting prevention tools, uh, for example, are regulators, governments of countries on board? Are developers and manufacturers on board? Is there enough funding for the rollout? Wow. Uh, what will happen? Because there is, uh, rightly so, there is an emphasis on African nations. And I always keep on wondering, will this ever come to India? And will other Asia Pacific nations uh, have, can have the rollout or will they have to do bridge studies? There are so many questions in our minds here. There are so many, so many questions, Shoba, because we, again, science moved very quickly. Um, yeah. How many regulatory agencies are aware of the depivering ring or long-acting injectable cabotegravir? How many communities are, are, are out there pounding the streets, demanding access in the way that we did 20 years ago for antiretroviral treatment? And the answer is not enough. Um, and so we have a lot to do. And again, it goes back to this issue. So often we get um, almost intoxicated with, the, with the, the, the wonderment of these new technologies. And we don't think about what we need to do next. And, and I would say that when you get the results of a phase three trial, that is not the beginning of the end of the journey. I argue that's the end of the beginning. That's one phase to get us a product that, that even is shown to be safe and effective. It then has to get WHO guidelines and WHO pre-qualification. It needs national regulatory review. It needs funders to invest not only in buying the product. We don't just need to buy the pivoting vaginal rings and eventually long-acting injectable cabotegravir. We have to train health workers. We have to create the supply chain. We have to do demand creation and social marketing so that people understand that those options are their right to have a choice from among. Um, so there's a huge number of, of steps. You know, we, we, we really have these um, descriptions of phase one, phase two, phase three in clinical research, but we don't do a good enough job of explaining regulatory approval, national guidelines, health system strengthening, health training, marketing and demand creation for potential users of these products. And that will cost as much or more than the product development. And I think sadly, many times funders think that their big investments is 
end with the product development. If we only do research and development and forget about the second D of delivery, these products don't do anything. And, and so I don't think we are ready. Now, the good news is that we've had now eight years of programs around oral prep. And we struggled as a com global community in rolling out oral prep. The good news is eight years later, we now, and we just presented data here at the Research for Prevention Conference um, through our global prep tracker that's available to anybody on, on prepwatch.org to see that we are finally seeing um, relatively larger numbers of people initiating oral prep. It's taken us eight years. So the challenge for us is how do we do that faster with the pivoting ring and with cabotegravir and with every next generation product that's still to come so that where we're presenting data of a million new users, not eight years after the product was approved, but five years or three years or two years, we have got to go faster. You know, COVID research benefited a lot from HIV. Right. The platforms that were created at HIV really helped facilitate a lot of that COVID research. Mm -hmm. HIV now needs to learn from COVID. The sense of urgency, the sense of regulatory process, the sense of guideline development, of scaling a product up. Um, what's happened with COVID, not just in the science of development, but in that rapid delivery, although it's been a struggle, as you know, all over the world to get these vaccines out, um, we're struggling two months later rather than two years or 20 years later. So we see that it is possible to condense those timelines and we need to do that in HIV. So the bar is, in my mind, oral prep set the bar um, of, of how hard it is. And we now need to go faster with every new product introduction. So I wanna sit at the next r for p in two years time and see the pivoting ring in two years where oral prep took five years. That'll tell me that the world is rallying and beginning to be more responsive um, to the epidemic uh, and, and to the challenge of, of introducing a new product. And that brings me back to the female condom about which I've been so passionate. And of course, who would have been more passionate than you? <laughs> that it, it really did not get that sort of uh, sort of rollout and support from governments uh, and authorities as it should have been. And yeah. it means uh, you'd be surprised to know, even in India, uh, when I talk to people, there are many women who don't even know that this product exists. And, yeah. and these are all the educated women. I'm not talking of illiterate people. So that is that was the work which perhaps was not done very yeah. properly. And that brings my, to my mind one more uh, point. When the female condom was regulated, like it was approved mm. in India, uh, one of the trial participants, she said, when will I get it? Will I ever get it or not? And so that brings us to the question to ensure that any new prevention product goes at first to those who participated in the clinical trials and to the communities from which they Come. You are, you know, Shobha, what you've said, I mean, I'm smiling. I mean, we've worked together for decades and yes, I spent a fair bit of time trying. And I think in some places, I think collectively we succeeded with the female condom in many places we struggled. Again, I go back to this issue that history may not repeat itself, yes. but it rhymes a lot. You know, what happened with oral prep is actually not dissimilar. Um, yes. There are still communities all over the world that don't know that oral prep even exists. Um, in the same way that decades after, people still didn't know the female condom existed. Um, and it really speaks to this need to focus not only on the products. And we often said in the female condom, and we say it with oral prep, it's not just the product. You know, oral prep doesn't magically appear in people's mouths because it exists in clinical trials. The vaginal ring doesn't magically appear in women's vaginas because we did clinical trials. It's the programs that need to deliver that and create that demand and that education um, and we've done a terrible job historically in, in introducing these technologies. We got a, oral prep did a little better than we did with female condom. We need to do a lot better with the next generation of products. Um, and so um, I think that's this lesson that, that we learned harshly, but there were a lot of people who just thought, oh, well, the female condom was approved and women didn't use it. It must be, they didn't like the product, but most women in this world still don't even know the female condom exists or, or a provider predetermined that that person may not want or need it. So again, it's that issue of, of have we let individuals be aware of and make choices that fit for their lives. And 
the good news is the female condom still exists. It's still a powerful prevention option. Um, and we mustn't forget that. And that even as we add oral prep into Pivering Ring and Cabotegravir and whatever comes next, they don't replace the other methods. People still need access to male and female condoms as part of, again, choices and as part of combination prevention. But I also want to come to this issue of trial participants. And I think one of the other things that's really important that happened this week at the Research for Prevention Conference is that um, UNAIDS and the World Health Organization launched a new version of the ethics guidance that we all, that many of us worked on now 14 years ago. It came out in 2007. And they're updated and they reassert the importance of um, good participatory practice throughout the trial conduct and the trial design. They also reassert that good participatory practice in the commitments of sharing not only the data from clinical trials, but when products are safe and effective, the products themselves with trial participants. Um, and I think as advocates, we need to watch very closely are the women who were in the depivering ring um, trials over the last six years, are they getting access to the ring once it's approved in their country? Are the communities prioritized? And I really believe um, strongly that we owe so much debt to the people who are in clinical trials. You know, clearly scientists and product developers and the people that run the clinical trials are, are heroes. They, they have really advanced the science, but we must never forget that without the tens of thousands of people in the clinical trials, a clinical trial can't answer a question. Without trial participants, there are no answers. And we owe them not only gratitude and thanks for being in the trial, but I do think when products are safe and effective, we owe them um, access and the communities from which they come access to these products. And so we need to be watching as advocates that where the depivering ring trials happened, that where the cabotegravir trials happened, you know, what we call HPTN 083 and 084, those trials, we need to make sure that they are prioritized with access and with the opportunity um, to, to really help be at the, at the vanguard of product uh, introduction. Okay. Anything else you would like to share, Michelle, and then, then your message for HIVR4P, this fourth HIVR4P, and for the uh, HIV community in general? Oh, uh, sure. But we'll just thank you because I think, you know, we talk about all these different stakeholders and it takes researchers and scientists and funders and trial participants and communities, and it takes journalists, um, the media to help get this message out. So thank you for being part of these stakeholder groups trying to advance HIV research. I think I'd say that we stand at, at one of the most precarious moments in public health. You know, we have seen um, progress in HIV, in TB, um, in contraceptive supplies. Um, we've seen really quite significant progress over the last decade. Certainly, um, I, we often say that never confuse progress with success. We have not succeeded, but we've made progress um, in, in, in all of those areas in basic vaccination. And over the last now 13 months, COVID has, has undercut that progress. Um, fewer children getting vaccinated, women struggling to get access to contraceptives, HIV treatment and prevention programs struggling, access to malaria bed nets set back, um, access to D TB prophylaxis and TB treatment set back. Um, so even, even as we scale up COVID vaccines, as we must, with a rights-based approach, with equity um, globally, because COVID anywhere is COVID everywhere, even as we do that, if we forget HIV and TB and malaria and contraceptive supplies and basic vaccinations, global health will be set back decades. And those hard fought gains over the decades will take us many more decades to even get back to where we were early 2020. And we as a global community have to be able um, to have a strategic view to building a resilient, and sustainable response with research and with health system delivery that can do um, more than one pandemic at a time. Uh, because when COVID you know, does get resolved somehow, some way, there'll be another pandemic um, and there'll still be HIV and there'll still be TB. Um, so I don't want to, to, to end this because I love talking with you, Shoba. I don't want to end this on a, on a negative note. Um, I want to end this on the hopeful note that science moves quickly and has moved quickly in HIV, in TB, in COVID. And we have a responsibility as advocates and as a global community 
um, to take those, those fruits of science and make them real, whether it's a COVID vaccine, whether it's a new TB treatment, whether it's HIV prevention. Um, so the task is huge. Um, the opportunities though, um, to, to do the right thing and to meet people where they are and to improve um, global public health has never been more opportune. We have more tools in more areas and we have to learn to use them faster and better and more equitably. Um, so that's what 2021 holds. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, and I look forward to doing it with you and colleagues um, all over the world. Amen to what all you have said and may, may it come true. And let us hope with people that are like you at the helm, I'm sure a progress will translate into success also. Uh, so thank you so much, Michelle. We were in conversation with Michelle Warren, Executive Director of AVAC and Co-Chair of the 4th HIVRPP Conference, which is being held online this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much. And thank you, Shoba. Stay safe and well and yes, stay in touch. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.